chapter 2. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more, they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter. wisdom intact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for them, for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you are lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come and the revealer of mystery showed you what is going to happen. As for me, This mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, 
but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay... Might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. And finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, chief ministers over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Sam is going to come preach for us now. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. Morning, everybody. Uh, keep that passage open in front of you. Let's just take a moment to pray. Father, you are the God of gods, the Lord of kings. You are the revealer of mysteries. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes this morning, that through these two and a half thousand year old words, we would hear your voice and that you would change our lives this morning. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, you may have noticed there's a fair bit going on in our world that could do with fixing. You may have woken up and think the weather needed fixing, but there are things all over the place, whether it's globally, whether it's nationally, whether it's locally, whether it's personally, there is an awful lot that we see that is broken. And today, we're going to find the answer. See, in the Bible, there is a quality that we are to pursue. 
a gift from God that we are to cherish and to want almost above all else. What is it? It's wisdom. Now, wisdom is different from knowledge. Martha, my three-year-old, she came home from nursery this week with a picture. Daddy, come and look at my picture. Now, with knowledge, I could have said, what on earth is that? That is awful. I've got no idea what that is. I didn't. I engaged my superior powers of wisdom and said, oh, that's nice, Martha. Tell me about it. To which she said, don't worry, Daddy, it's just squiggles. So I, I could have gone with my first thought, but anyway, I didn't. I decided to use wisdom instead of knowledge. You see, wisdom is the right application of knowledge. It's knowing stuff, but then knowing what to do with what we know. I, we, society, we know things, but what we do with them, that's the question that brings us towards wisdom. And whether it's how we respond to each other in everyday life, whether it's how we deal with wars around the world, the question is, are we going to act wisely? For wisdom is both needed and so often lacking. See, the Bible is clear that true wisdom, lasting wisdom, is only found in the all-wise gods. Later on from these words, in the second half of the Bible, we read these words that were written by James, the brother of Jesus. If any of you lacked wisdom, you should ask gods. It's not rocket science, is it? How do you get wisdom? You ask gods. Yet so often, we, and I include myself in this, we fail to do it. We don't bring our hopes and our fears and our problems and our desires to him. We don't dig into his word to hear him speaking to us. We have access to the infinite source of wisdom, and yet so often we try and go our own way and work things out with our own wisdom. Which is why we need the book of Daniel, the book that Laura just read from. See, here we see a man whose world had come crashing down around him. As Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the superpower at the time, came and wiped out his homeland, Everything that he had known, everything that he had loved and cherished wiped out and the people taken into Babylon to be assimilated as Babylonians. Yet in all of this, Daniel was able to live wisely for God. How was that? Was he bright? Probably. I think he was. Did he understand lots of things? Well, maybe. Was he given great opportunities? Well, certainly that was true. But we saw the defining factor last week in chapter 1, that in the midst of all of the pressures, all of the uncertainties of life, the Lord met with him as he met with the Lord. Look at chapter 1 and verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Yes, they had knowledge, but where it says learning, the original is better translated wisdom and all of it a gift from God. Daniel and his friends had asked God for wisdom and God had poured it out in abundance. How do we navigate this often confusing world globally and personally? By expressing through prayer our dependence upon the all-wise God who by his spirit makes us more like Jesus in the way that we act and the way that we think. So as we cry out to God, Lord, we want to be wise, he'll tell us quite simply to come to him, to come to him with the impossible, to come to him in your prayers and to come to him for answers. So first, the impossible. As chapter 2 begins, we meet a king with sleep issues. Verse 1, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. The king is troubled, wants to know what this dream means. And in the days before Googling it, he has to bring these wise men together 
so that he can find out what's going on with the dream. And they're well up for it. Look at verse 4. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Good to start with a bit of flattery. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. But things don't go quite according to their plan. Verse 5. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. Well, that escalated quickly. It's not quite what we signed up for when we decided to be the wise men. Couldn't imagine Martin Luther King back in the 60s. I have a dream, but I'm not going to tell you about it. You've got to work it out for yourselves. Verse 6. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more, they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. But the king sticks to his guns and he says he wants an interpretation Leading to the wise men saying something in verse 11, what the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. And that didn't go down well, verse 12. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Imagine being Daniel getting that message. In a meeting that you weren't at, a group of people who don't represent you, the king gave an impossible task that you know nothing about, and now I'm here to kill you. It's a little harsh, isn't it? I wonder how you would have responded. Look at verse 14. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise man of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Great work, Daniel. Great work. Wisdom and tact. That's what's needed. Verse 15. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh degree? Ariok then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. See, this is a crazy situation. Imagine a teacher saying, your homework is due in tomorrow. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but if you don't do it, you're expelled. It's crazy, isn't it? What would you say? That's, it's not fair. It's impossible. What am I supposed to do? See, whatever was going on in the king's head... Maybe he'd forgotten the dream. Maybe he didn't trust his advisors and was wanting to test them. He laid before them this impossible task, which spells trouble for Daniel and his friends. See, impossibility can be an all too familiar part of everyday life. You're stuck in this financial or relational or medical cycle, and you just can't get out of it. It seems impossible that anything will change. And the only end point looks like suffering and despair. It's impossible. It's not fair. Where do you turn? See, there are times when the impossible looms over us like an ogre. It's like it's blocking the light, threatening to devour us. We can't get away. There's no path forward. All I can see is impossibility. What we need in those moments are the words of the Lord Jesus from Luke 18. Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. See, the ogre may loom over us, but the Lord Jesus towers over all. Every situation, every problem, every impossibility. When we feel that we are imprisoned by life, when we think that these impossibilities have got us hemmed in, he has the key. And he sent his son to open up life and to set us free from the burden of living under these impossibilities. See, Jesus Christ himself is the answer to the advisor's woe in verse 11. Jesus, the eternal God, the Son, he left his heavenly place and he came to live among humans. The gods don't live among the humans. Well, they do in the person of the Lord Jesus. The impossibility of humanity knowing God, of being able to receive his wisdom for him, made real by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. So friends, come to him with the impossible. Come to him with those things that you think they're just too big. I'm just going to get used to having them in my life. No, bring them to God. Pour out your heart in prayer before the one who can do all things and rejoice that he has come to you in wisdom and power and tenderness. He has come to you so that you may come to him. The all-loving, the all-powerful, the all-wise God is waiting for you. So come. 
Come with the impossible and come in your prayers. But the question is, what does that look like? What does it mean to do that? You see, Daniel saw this situation. He'd understood from Ariok what was going on. And his first thought were his three friends. Verse 17. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. I bet there was more than a hint of desperation in their prayers as they call on the name of the Lord to help them, to meet them in this situation. And what a moment we see in verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And with the impossible made possible through the God of heaven, Daniel praises. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You've made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. See, as we follow Daniel through this book, our focus is to be on prayer. It's to see a prayerful life in action and the fruit of that communion, that closeness, that relationship with God. There'll be times when we look at Daniel and his friends and we just think, wow, these guys are amazing. I could never be like that. But that would be to miss the point. Yes, we're to look at Daniel. Yes, we're to look at his friends, but we're not to stop there. See, Daniel's secret is no secret at all. He longed for a deeper relationship with his God. And so he spent time in the scriptures and came to him regularly in prayer. That's what shaped Daniel and enabled him to do these incredible things. And here we see him responding to the impossible. Notice first from verses 17 and 18 that he wanted to pray in community. He was in a battle, one that his friends were going to be drawn into as well. And he didn't want to face this battle alone. He wanted to hear their voices, to sit with them, to be encouraged by their hearts before the Lord. We are to spur one another on. And that comes through community. And when we gather to pray as a church... They are the most poorly attended meetings that we run. Why is that? We're in a battle. And we shouldn't be facing this alone. It shouldn't be the few who are talking to the Lord about these things. I don't like praying out loud. I don't like the format. I haven't got time. Ultimately, we need to look beyond that and to our hearts. It doesn't matter what I think. What does the Lord Jesus think about your reasons? What is his view of your attitude to these things? See, later in this book, we'll see solitary prayer. But here, the focus is on community. How will we respond to that? And it feeds into the second thing that we see, the urgency of verse 18. Do you see that? He urged them to plead. And I sometimes wonder if small prayer meetings are the result of a lack of urgency. That we're quite comfortable. Things are pretty good. What's the worst thing that happened this morning? Well, it rained. It's not bad, is it? We can probably cope with that. We're pretty content. And we don't acknowledge the danger that people are in who don't know Jesus. How excited we would be if 200 people were in this morning. Yet even if all 200 people lived in Headley Park, that would still only be 3% of Headley Park. Haven't even started to think about Bedminster Down yet. Where is our urgency before the Lord? And alongside community and urgency, Daniel also knows his God. Did you see what he asks his friends to plead for from God in verse 18? Maybe that they'd know the answer. Maybe that... The big guys with the big sticks wouldn't find them. No, no, no. Verse 18, he urged them to plead for mercy. He knows that he deserves nothing 
from God. He's not coming before God saying, I am Daniel. I have great wisdom and understanding. Just give me a bit more. No, no, no. He comes before God and says, I am nothing. Please, please show your mercy to your people. Here is the great God. And together and urgently, they plead for mercy. And the Lord demonstrates his love in verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And it could be at this point that Daniel thinks, great, I've got the answer. I've got a few hours, Kip, ready for a big day tomorrow. But no, it's straight into praise. The overflow of his heart is, yes, you've answered my prayer. Thank you, Lord. Okay, now into praise. His praying continues because he's seen God at work. What a spur to prayer it is when we see God at work. And what a view of God that he has in those verses. We see the majesty and the sovereignty as he changes seasons and deposes kings. We see the closeness and the tenderness as he gives wisdom and he reveals hidden things. See, Daniel's prayer life is not shaped by guilt or by duty, but by a glorious vision of the Lord. If you said to Daniel, why do you pray? He'd be like, well, why not? Because I see who God is and this is my response. If you're struggling to pray, maybe it's because your view of the Lord isn't big enough. Maybe you need to have him magnified in your vision so that you can do nothing but say, wow, and respond to him in prayer. Take prayers like this. Take Daniel's words. Meditate on them. Look at them. Understand why Daniel said them. See the God that he praised. Come along tonight or listen to our series on the character of God and understand more of who he is. Read through one of the Gospels and see the majesty and the sovereignty and the tenderness and the closeness of Jesus Christ. The better that we know him, the more that we want to spend time with him. How can we be wise? Come in prayer to the one who gives wisdom, the one who delights in coming to you and give gifts abundantly to his children. We come to him with impossible things. We come in prayer and we come for his answers. The next morning comes and Daniel gets up and we see the fruit of Daniel's prayers. Verse 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. See, Daniel acknowledges in verse 27 the impossibility of the king's task. He doesn't want any of this to reflect well on Daniel. He doesn't want it to be that Daniel has worked it out. No, no, no. It is the God in heaven who has done these things. He is the revealer. And so Daniel reveals the dream. Verse 31. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. But that's only half the job. He's told Nebuchadnezzar what the dream is, and in verse 36, he begins to interpret the dream. And we see the personal nature of it at the end of verse 38. Uh, Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. In this dream, the head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar and the king of Babylon. The parts of the statue, they represent kingdoms. And just as gold is superior to the other metals, so no kingdom that follows will match Babylonian, Babylon's splendor. Verse 39, after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there'll be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things into pieces, so it will crush and will break all the others. This was the God of heaven revealing the future. 
After Babylon came the Medes and the Persians, the silver section. Then the Greeks, represented by the bronze midriff. And then came the Roman Empire, built on the strength of iron crushing and breaking all other kingdoms. This was God revealing through a dream and through Daniel the future to Nebuchadnezzar. See, Daniel praised God for being the one who deposes kings and raises up others. And here we see the scope of that control. God is the God of the whole world. And everything and everyone rises and falls at his command. But this is more than just a history lesson for us. This is more than just saying, isn't it good that the Bible predicts things and then they happen? The big finish to the dream was there in verse 34. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue of its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Well, what's that about? What's going on there? Well, Daniel tells us in verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. When these kings are ruling, a kingdom not of this world will rise up. One that looks small and puny by comparison yet will bring an end to all of the others and will endure forever. What will bring an end to those seemingly endless cycles of impossibility and pain? It's the wisdom of God as revealed in his eternal kingdom. See, Jesus Christ and his kingdom is the little rock that will endure forever. Remember these words as the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary? The beginning of the nativity story. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And at the heart of his kingdom, at the heart of this topsy-turvy kingdom where he looks puny and weak but turns out to be the glorious mountain that fills the whole earth. It's his death and his resurrection that are at the center of it all. Look at these words of Paul in 1 Corinthians. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Where do we find the power and the wisdom that we need for life? In Jesus Christ and him, crucified, resurrected, and ascended. He is always God's answer. Whatever prayer we are praying, Jesus is the answer. Whatever impossibility we have, it is Jesus who is the key to walking through that with wisdom and power. He always has been and he always will be. See, this is what revolutionizes prayer. We know what Daniel didn't. We know more of this dream than Daniel did. Not just the history, but the glory of the kingdom from that little rock. The ultimate deep and hidden thing, how God and humanity could be reconciled, revealed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. When we see the scale and the scope of the gospel, how across history and geography, it unites people to God. Our only response should be praise and worship that he has set his love upon us. What kindness there is, what grace in the God who meets with his people. How should we live this week? Whether it's full of bright and happy things, whether it's full of impossibilities. Individually and corporately, as those prayerfully rejoicing that through Christ our sin has been forgiven, that we have access to the God of wisdom and power and he gives freely and we come to him. Come to him with your impossibilities. Come to him with your prayers. And find in Christ the one who is worthy of all of your prayers. And who will walk with you every step of the way. Day by day. So that you may know that you are not alone. So that you may know that you have all that you need. 
and you may know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your God is with you and will keep you to the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We praise you for his kingdom, that little rock that became a mountain that fills the earth. And Lord, how we need the wisdom and power of the Lord Jesus in our lives. Father, we pray on a global scale that you will bring peace where there is war. That you would bring mercy and love and compassion where there is fear and dominance. And we pray that in our own lives, when we look at the cycles that we're in, I pray that we would see Jesus. And that we would find in him all that we need to live for you and to delight in the future to come. Father, I pray that we would be a community that communes with our God. That individually and corporately we would long to call upon your name, to urgently plead for mercy. That we would see you at work in our own lives, in the lives of our church, in the lives of South Bristol, across our country and into our world. Father, we need you. We can do nothing without you. And we pray that we would see you at work. And that as we come to you, we would know that you have already come to us and delight in that truth. Praise you, God of heaven.